Hi, <laughs> starting slightly late with um, typical aplomb. Welcome to um, the launch of the State of uh, Tax Justice 2023. I'm Alex Cobham, um, Chief Executive at the Tax Justice Network. Um, to begin, let me say we have interpretation available to English, Spanish, Portuguese and French. Um, so to listen to this session and the following one in your preferred language, um, please just click the interpretation bottom at the bottom uh, button at the bottom of the screen um, and choose the language that you want to follow in. We'll have speakers uh, primarily in English in this session and primarily in Spanish in the following session. Um, and yeah, I should say that these two events. In the first hour today, we're going to be launching and discussing the, uh, the latest State of Tax Justice uh, report that's published today. Um, and I hope you'll have seen that in the national and international media all around the world, uh, where it's been very well covered already. We'll then go into a, a second session, which is a hybrid event um, uh, hosted in Cartagena in Colombia. Um, and that's the opening session of the Civil Society Days of the first Latin American and Caribbean Summit on Inclusive, Sustainable and Equitable Global Taxation. And that second event takes place in partnership um, with an amazing alliance of regional and international organizations um, who I, I should list here. So that's the Centro Interdisciplinario de Estudios sobre el Desarrollo, and CIDUR the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, the Foro Social Pan-Amazonico, Pan the Global Initiative for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Independent Commission for Reform of International Corporate Taxation, ECRICT, um, the Human Rights Principles in Fiscal Policy Initiative, Latin Dad, Oxfam, Public Services International, uh, the Red de Trabajo Fiscal, and the Red de Justicia Fiscal de America Latina uh, y el Caribe. Um, that's the regional um, tax justice network, part of the Global Alliance uh, for Tax Justice. But the kind of overall framing for this, both the state of tax justice uh, launch now and this uh, event in, in Cartagena, which becomes a ministerial level event led by Colombia, Chile and Brazil um, in a couple of days time, is really about how we choose to set international tax policy and how we create national tax policy space and sovereignty. Um, and the, the recognition that over the last 10 years, the international tax rules have really been in the hands of the OECD, a group of rich countries, um, and they have largely failed to deliver the kind of progress that we all need. And for that reason, there's a push now to both regional and genuinely globally inclusive uh, tax policy setting under the auspices of the United Nations. So we're looking at intergovernmental discussions already begun and the possibility of negotiations on a UN tax convention in the coming uh, months. But right now, what we wanna do is look at the, the scale of the problem uh, and the degree to which uh, there really hasn't been progress. Um, so in this session, uh, we have a, a great uh, panel to look at this and to think about the kind of impacts that that's had both the direct revenue losses, but also the, the broader and deeper impacts in the context of the multiple crises that we face globally, crises of inequality, crises of climate um, and conflict uh, going on at the same time. Um, we'll talk about the extent to which tax is, in a sense, a social superpower that gives us the opportunity to push back and to protect ourselves against these crises, but that because of the international tax failures, we're simply not, not yet doing that. So we're gonna to start today with a presentation from Alison Schultz, um, who's a research fellow with the Tax Justice Network. Um, then we'll hear from um, Irene Avonji Odida, who is a commissioner for ICRIT, and uh, we're very proud to say uh, the chair of the board of the Tax Justice Network. Irene's also um, a member of the high level panel on illicit financial flows out of Africa, and was a member of the UN faculty panel um, and so has been engaged in really leading this work at the African regional level and globally uh, for more than a decade now. And then we'll hear from Owen Tudor, who is the Deputy General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, 
know, as well as being a long-standing um, uh, member of the of the labour movement uh, in all sorts of uh, areas, um, Owen is also um, you know at the centre of the ITUC's work uh, on tax, recognising the importance of tax justice for labour uh, internationally. Um, so to the audience, let me invite you as we go through to use the Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask questions to the panellists. Once we've heard um, the first uh, remarks from each of our panel, we'll go into a Q&A in the second half um, uh, of this session and uh, do, do, as I say, switch into your preferred language with the interpretation uh, button. Let me uh, then hand over, uh, with, with no more ado, um, to Alison Schultz um, to take us through uh, the methodology that we've used in the state of tax justice to generate global and national uh, estimates for the cost of cross-border tax abuse, um, and to talk us through what those numbers actually look like, what the scale, the state uh, of tax justice is in 2023. So, Alison, uh, over to you. Thank you, Alex. So let me share my screen to present these results. Okay, so I'm very happy to share with you the State of Tax Justice 2023, which is the most current estimates of how the world looks in the state of tax justice in this year. And in the following 10 to 12 minutes, I will present you first uh, the core estimates which we have produced this year. And secondly, the methodology which we've used to produce these estimates. As I only have 10 to 12 minutes, I will not be able to go into full detail of all our estimates and all the methodology. So those of you who are interested in more details here, please have a look at the State of Tax Justice Report, which is published on our website. I think the link will also be shared in the chat chat. And if you're interested in details on the methodology, please also have a look in our at our methodology note, which is also uploaded. Okay, to start with the estimates. So what does the world lose to tax abuse every year? So in our current report, we find that the world loses 472 billion US dollars to tax havens a year. And this estimate is actually composed of two different numbers. The first number is the cross-border corporate tax abuse by multinational corporations. So this is the type of tax abuse where multinational corporations record profits rather than reporting it in the country where the economic activity is happening in low tax jurisdictions in order to pay very little or no taxes at all. We estimate that this kind of tax abuse costs the world 301 billion US dollars every year. The second part which we estimate is the offshore tax evasion by wealthy individuals. So this means that wealthy individuals hide their wealth offshore in order to avoid being taxed on the proceeds of this wealth. We estimate that this offshore tax evasion by wealthy individuals costs the world 171 billion US dollars every year. The three numbers I'm presenting here are all based on 2018 data because for the cross-border corporate tax abuse, the data we're using, the most recent data is from 2018. So having presented these aggregate numbers, let us look into more detail on how these numbers look for the different countries. So what you see first here is how much different countries lose in tax abuse in absolute terms. So here you see what the countries lose together, both from corporate tax abuse and from tax abuse through wealthy individuals. And those countries which are shown in a darker color on the map lose more. Those countries which are shown in a lighter color on the map lose less in absolute terms. And in absolute terms, we see that higher income countries lose 426 billion US dollars every year, while lower income countries use an aggregate of 46 billion US dollars per year. However, if you look at how much countries lose as a percentage of what they actually have to spend, we find that lower income countries lose a way higher share of what they actually have to spend. So what you see in this map is the percentage of public health spending, which is lost 
to both corporate and individual tax abuse. Again, those countries which are affected more heavily are shown in darker colors in the maps. In the map, those countries which are not so much affected in lighter colors. And here we find that the higher income countries lose an average of 9.3% of health spending to tax abuse, and lower income countries lose an average of 56% of their health budgets to tax abuse. And this goes up to numbers like 144% for India. So India loses almost one and a half their health, public health expenditure to tax abuse. Or the country which we find which is most affected here is Liberia, which loses more than five times the amount of the public health spending. We also look into who is actually making this loss able, so who is enabling this tax abuse, so which countries are responsible for these losses. And here we just look into which countries allow corporate multinational corporations to shift profits there without paying any or paying very low taxes, and which countries allow wealthy individuals to hide their assets there to avoid paying taxes at home. So I do this separately for cross-border corporate tax abuse by multinationals here and offshore tax evasion by wealthy individuals in a second part. So if we look at who is enabling cross-border corporate tax abuse by multinationals, we see that almost 70% of this tax abuse is enabled by OECD countries and their dependencies. Almost 50% or more than 50% is enabled by a few countries, which we call the axis of tax avoidance. So this is the UK together with its overseas territories and crown dependencies, Switzerland, the Net Netherlands and Luxembourg, who are together responsible for more than half of the cross-border corporate tax abuse for multinationals. The single most destructive actor is the UK's so-called second empire. So the UK together with its network of overseas territories and crown dependencies is responsible for almost a quarter of cross-border corporate tax abuse by multinationals. Let's look at who is responsible for offshore tax evasions by wealthy individuals. Here we see that more than 90% of offshore tax evasion is allowed by OECD countries and their dependencies who allow wealthy individuals to hide their wealth there in order to avoid paying taxes. Again, the axis of tax avoidance, which is Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Switzerland and the UK, is responsible for over 60% of offshore tax evasion by wealthy individuals and the UK so-called second empire is responsible for almost half of the offshore tax evasion by wealthy individuals. In the following, I will now go, now go into detail on the methodology we use to both estimate cross-border corporate tax abuse and to estimate offshore tax evasion by wealthy individuals. So I start with our estimate for cross-border corporate tax abuse. And this estimate is largely built on the notion of misaligned profits. So when we say misaligned profits, what we mean are profits which are recorded, not in the jurisdiction where the economic activity is taking place, but rather in a jurisdiction where the company hopes to pay no taxes or very little tax. We estimate these misaligned profits starting from the expected profits. So what you see in this graph here is the expected profit for one international or multinational corporations. So let's assume this multinational corporation has a factory in Bangladesh is producing a product there, is selling this product in Kenya and has its headquarters in Jersey. So if you want to distribute the economic activity of this corporation, we could say that half of the economic activity is happening in Bangladesh, 40% of the economic activity is happening in Kenya, and maybe 10% of the economic activity is happening in Jersey. Of course, you can debate about what is the exact correct share for different notions of economic activity. And in order to allow for some variation here, we have calculated this for different formulas to calculate these expected profits. And we find very similar results for the different formulas. So having the expected profits, we compare these expected profits of a multinational to the profits which this multinational actually reports. So in the example I give here, this multinational really tries to shift profits to where corporate income taxes are low. So the company is actually reporting 100% of profits in Jersey in the headquarter and reports as if no profit was generated in Bangladesh and no profit was generated in Kenya. 
So what we do to calculate misaligned profits now is we deduct these expected profits from these reported profits to assess how much misaligned profits we have in the different jurisdictions. In this example, for instance, in Jersey, we would see very highly, profit, uh, highly, very highly positive misaligned profits, while in Bangladesh and Kenya, we would see negative misaligned profits. In order to do all of this calculation, we use country by country reporting from data from the OECD, which allows us to see for multinationals from several jurisdictions where they have reported their profits, where they have their employees, where they have their, sa their sales, and where they have their assets. And we only consider misaligned profits, which are shifted to low tax jurisdictions. So if we have a company which is actually shifting profits to another jurisdiction where it also pays lots of taxes, we will not consider this part of the data. Secondly, we multiply these misaligned profits with a tax rate that would be applicable in the country of economic activity. So if we take the example from before, we would multiply the misaligned profits of Kenya by the corporate income tax rate for Kenya, and we would multiply the misaligned profits of Bangladesh by the corporate income tax rate of Bangladesh to see how much taxes these two countries are losing. We then obtain the total estimates for the world where we see that profit shifted in 2018 amount to 1.1 trillion US dollars and cause a tax loss of 301 billion US dollars, the estimate which I've also presented earlier. Let's come to the methodology on how we estimate offshore tax evasion by wealthy individuals. So here we have to say first that there are already estimates of how much wealth is hidden offshore. So we know the total amount of wealth hidden offshore, and now we try to somehow get an estimate from this total amount of wealth hidden offshore on how much tax is lost by this. So what we do here first is we identify in which jurisdiction people would actually like to hide their wealth. And we identify these jurisdictions by looking at jurisdictions which have surprisingly many invert bank deposits. So many foreigners seem to have a bank deposit there and who also have a very high level of secrecy, so they don't seem to be super strict on reporting who is owning these assets. So how do we estimate these abnormal inward bank deposits, or how can we know this? We can actually observe that we can quite well predict how many inward bank deposits a country has have by looking at its GDP. So a country with a higher GDP, if we move here, will on average also have more inward bank deposits. And so we see that most of the country of this, of this world are actually more or less on this line in the relationship between GDP and inward bank deposits. However, we see some countries which have way more inward bank deposits as we would assume from its GDP. For instance, you see the Cayman Islands here, which should have inward bank deposits about this high, but they are actually here. So this means that they have a very high abnormal inward bank deposits. Secondly, we only consider those countries who have enough secrecy to hide wealth effectively, let's say like this. And we see that many of these countries, which have a very high abnormal inward bank deposit, also have a high score in ownership registration. This means that those countries don't are not very strict in reporting who is actually owning the assets, so you can hide the wealth well there. And they also have many abnormal inward bank deposits, making them good candidates to hide my wealth there. Having identified these jurisdictions, we look at the origin of these abnormal bank deposits. So we look into who is actually owning the deposits in these countries. In order to do this, we use also step in one and two, we use data from the Bank for International Settlement. In particular, we use the cross-border bank deposits from the Bank for International Set Settlements. We then use this share of countries offshore wealth, which we identify in one and two, and combine it with the existing estimates of total hidden offshore wealth, which I've talked before. So we know how much wealth is hidden, and we just distribute it to the different countries based on step one and two. We then multiply the hidden wealth with the applicable tax rates on expected capital gains on the wealth which people hold abroad. We then end up with an estimate of hidden wealth, which was 2018, which was 
9.9 trillion in the year 2018. This is the estimate which has existed before, like I said. And we calculate that this is causing a tax loss through hidden wealth of 171 billion US dollar in 2018. Thank you very much for listening. Like I said, we have more information. We have the press releases, all results, and the full methodology at the link which I show here and which will also be shared in the chat. Alison, thanks very much. That's that's great. Um, you may have seen we're already getting questions coming in on this, and I'll bring some of them back to you in, in the Q&A. Um, but right now, let me um, move on to Irina um, uh to talk in some sense, more on the uh, the political context um, uh, for these numbers, you know, what this means, and perhaps what uh, what we should be doing uh, in response. So, Irene, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alex, and, and thank you, Alison, as well, for, for that really um, illuminating presentation. I think we all can see quite clearly that there's an urgency of the need to curb abuse. Uh, there's a need to deal with, the, chat, with, with the, the issue of tax abuse and the global international system that enables it to happen. I, I won't go into the challenges that countries from the global south face because we all know what they are. And, and increasingly those problems are faced by other countries as well. So countries from the global north, I won't go into detail about it, but we know issues around debt, inflation, inequality and we've seen in the, in the past few years this inequality growing uh, between countries and within countries and then also just growing fiscal injustice. Um, so um, the question one might ask is what has tax abuse got to do with all of this? I think the first thing is for us to understand the relationship um, between taxes and development. Taxes are a sustainable way of, of funding public goods and services all sorts of infrastructure, all sorts of public works, public programs uh, from, from health to education to environmental, defense, security, law enforcement, social welfare and all are, are very much um, hinged or predicated on having, on countries having sufficient domestic resources um, that, are, that are mobilized locally through taxation. Uh, but we see that currently, and, and many different studies have, have spoken to this, uh, the global financial architecture uh, is designed in a way that taxes that ought to be paid to developing nations where the relevant income is sourced, and Alison has spoken to this, are now streamed away um, to rich countries and in particular to tax havens. And so there's a huge uh, cost of development and multiple crises that countries are, are dealing with in the past few years. Uh, the governments are not able to deal with it. The most recent being um, you know, the, the, the COVID pandemic, where we saw very much the importance of the role of the state in, in dealing with some of those public issues, in that case, public health. Um, so there is the multiple crises and not enough domestic revenues being generated by, by governments to respond to those crises and also to, to, to manage development. And all of this happening at a time when so much is being drained out. And we've just, we've just heard, heard about that um, through things like aggressive tax planning and, and tax evasions and so on which um, somebody says you could actually think of it as blood money because this is money that is being made of the backs and the lives of, of, of the, the very poorest and the most vulnerable, including workers. Uh, so taxes could also be used to address economic inequality. And that's an equally urgent thing with the this, with this spiraling inequality that we see between countries and within countries. Uh, this would require a redistribution of, of, of wealth um, through the tax policy from wealthier individuals to the less affluent. So if we had progressive taxation or taxes targeted at social programs, we could see um, issues that affect the vulnerable, the marginalized, um, lower cadre workers actually addressed much more fairly. It would also shift the burden of taxation that increasingly falls on ordinary citizens and small medium enterprises, domestic companies. Um, it increasingly falls on them instead of on multinationals whose wealth is, is much, much more and whose ability to pay is much higher. So unfortunately, we see that tax abuse has become an instrument for economic inequality as, as the rich, the ultra rich and the multinationals use a considerable economic influence to win tax breaks for them and to push countries into either tax competition or into re retrogressive tax systems. 
Um, so we, we, found, we found with the Becky panel that the, in Africa, uh, when we did the report in 2015, we found that the principal instigators of, of illicit flows from Africa uh, uh, were, the, were multinational corporations. And this was primarily through the kind of practices that Alison has spoken to, um, to tax and trade abuse, including abusive transfer pricing and trade misinvoicing and you know, BIPs practices. So the, the report in 2015 found that the, the level of IFS was at um, 50, 50 billion US dollars, but by 2020, Ankta found this figure had grown to just under 90 billion USD. So it's a growing problem. And the other challenge and why there's such an urgency is that we see increasingly, um, and this has happened for a long time, but some, in some ways it's, it's, it's just getting harder and harder. Increasingly, we see rich countries banding together, rich governments banding together um, to, to really push uh, a system that continues to, be, to, to unfairly um, privilege the, the taxing rights for themselves and which taxing rights they then also then build systems that support the poor within, within their own, I mean, the rich within their own country. So the reallocation of taxing rights is a really urgent issue between countries so that developing countries can have um, greater taxing rights, particularly in relation to multinational profits mm -hmm. generated within their economies, but also within countries so that the poor in all countries, both developing and developed countries um, have a, a fairer share of the, of, of the burden of tax and, and the rich take on what they should what they should be playing what they should be paying so finally i'll just say that um processes that we've seen currently like the oecd beps process have not delivered a, 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 a an outcome that can really make a difference neither responding to the challenges of digitalization or, or globalization and, and the globalized productive system that multinationals employ in order to gain the system um, against everybody else. So um, again, when you look at other existing systems um, or, or forums of FATIF and others, we found with the FATIF panel uh, process in 2020 and 21, that all these existing processes really systematically privilege the richer countries and disempower or do not benefit the, the, the lower and middle income countries uh, equally. So even when issues like uh, automatic exchange of, of information or beneficial ownership or country by country reporting, even the systems that have been designed to say by the EU or OECD to deal with them, those systems do not uh, give the same kind of access uh, or, or And we therefore need a solution that involves everybody. And the only space that one can see that would give this would be the UN, where there is a resolution that uh, was proposed last year by the Africa Group. And we need to see uh, countries of the global south come together, but also citizens of the global north who are disadvantaged, or part of the 1%, and are increasingly disadvantaged by the retrogressive systems, to come together and mobilize collectively for tax justice for, for all of us who fall into the 99%. So this Latin American summit that, that is ongoing is also a, a, a fantastic opportunity to mobilize uh, the global South and citizens of the world in this direction. Thank you. Thanks, Irene. Um, and it, it feels like a key point that, you know, we're talking both about inequalities between countries um, as Alison's presentation laid out, but also inequalities within countries. And arguably given the scale of losses in different places, one of the group's worst hit are people towards the lower end of the income distribution workers in high income countries um, where you know, they're, they're, um, the, the degree of um, redistribution is undermined by these um, failures to fix the international tax rules and with it, um, the, the space for inclusive um, public spending and responses to the, to the crises. So on that, um, let me hand over to, to Owen Tudor, um, who, as I say, is the, the Deputy General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. And I suppose, Owen, from the perspective of global labour, um, there are different uh, interests in different areas, and people see these both in public sector unions and private sector unions, in different ways and yet the broad position is is clear and, and you know you and the ITUC have become 
champions of a, of a tax justice agenda, I think it's fair to say. So let me invite you to, to share your perspective um, on, these, on these questions. Well, thanks very much, Alex. And uh, I, I, I'm honoured by, by the opportunity to, to speak today. And I want to pay tribute to the work that the Tax Justice Network and ICRIC have, uh, have, have played on, on these issues. Just, just to go straight to the heart of that uh, before I start my remarks, I think it's important to remember that uh, uh, Irene mentioned the 1% and the 99%. It, uh, really, when you start talking about tax and tax justice, uh, you are talking not about about the distinction between the rich and the poor, uh, which often bedevils some of these arguments, especially in the, in the global north, but also in, in many countries in, uh, uh, in, in uh, the global south. It, it's not so much the rich and the poor, it's the rich and the rest. Uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's almost everybody is disadvantaged by the sort of uh, tax abuses that we're discussing today and the structure of, uh, of global and national taxation systems. Uh, it isn't it isn't just the very poorest of the of our communities it's it, it is almost everybody let me let me start by um uh, telling you who the international trade union confederation is we are the largest democratic organization in the world we have nearly 200 million members in 167 countries and territories in fact if we were a country we would be one of the 10 largest countries in the world uh, and we represent workers of all kinds from Hollywood stars who are currently on strike in the uh, in the USA, uh, all the way down to street traders and rubbish pickers uh, who, uh, who who live on the very margins of the economy. Obviously, for us as a trade union movement, as an organization of working people, the cost of living crisis is probably our main uh, concern. But that doesn't mean that trade unionists aren't worried also about the climate emergency, about the spread of war and conflict around the world, and of course, the pandemic, which was in many cases a workplace pandemic uh, and exposed so many shortages uh, of, uh, of occupational safety and health as well as as public uh, public uh, health uh, we um uh, we're concerned obviously in that context with uh, how you encourage uh, workers to be better paid for their for their labor uh, through better wages through collective bargaining through changes to terms and conditions on things like occupational health and safety and gender based violence at the workplace hours of work and so on but we're also obviously concerned about the social wage about social protection pensions sick pay unemployment benefit uh, public service Services generally, uh, we want to see greater investment in the care economy uh, and in industrial development through uh, through public uh, public services. To get that, we need a more equal society. We need greater rights at work, and we need sustainable development, which is all part of the new social contract that we adopted at our uh, World Congress in uh, November in Melbourne. Now, Irene covered a lot of uh, the tax agenda for, for us, but, but tax plays a key role, uh, both through direct redistribution and indirectly through revenue generation for public services, uh, both of them driving uh, greater equality. Uh, taxes also change behaviour uh, among uh, the corporates and the rich, uh, things like carbon taxes, financial transaction taxes, windfall and wealth taxes can have a major impact on the behavior of those groups, but it is also worth noting um, that tax uh, can also impact on the behavior of working people uh, through non-progressive taxes like sales taxes, for instance. Uh, and uh, we also believe that uh, better tax policies will also restrict corporate influence and create greater scope for governments to act in the interests of the people, uh, not profits. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that used to be 
uh, a major issue uh, for poor countries, still is a major issue for poor countries, but increasingly we see that even in the richer countries where government ability to impact their societies is, is, is hugely restricted, both through loss of revenue uh, and also the increased political power uh, that, uh, that wealth gives people. In some ways, tax abuse is just the cream on the cake of this, uh, but we must have a tax system that operates openly and honestly uh, in terms of the uh, objectives that people through democratic means uh, set for them. Now, trade unions are obviously involved uh, at national level in national campaigns for fairer taxation, but capital and wealth are now more mobile than ever, so we need multilateral action uh, more uh, than ever. The UN is, we believe, uh, the organisation that should have the tax competence uh, to, to make a major step forward in this, uh, in this field, although we continue to act wherever, whatever multilateral uh, institution we can try and influence like the IMF and the OECD but we we do want to see the UN having that tax competence uh, to, to to make progress and and to make progress in the very near future as well with for instance the UN General Assembly that's upcoming uh, to make sure not least that there is equality uh, within countries but also between countries you need UN action but I'll finish on this point. Uh, even, you know, it's it's not a case simply of putting pressure on the UN. Uh, it, uh, the UN will only act when the governments that run the UN are put under significant pressure and substantial enough pressure to make change a reality. So the, uh, the struggle that we continue to operate on this basis, even though it has a global and an international perspective, uh, also requires uh, at, at base uh, action uh, in individual countries to make sure that governments are held to account for what they do in their international environments. Thanks very much. Thanks, Adam. Um, really great. And I think it's, it's such an important point that we're, you know, the, the focus on the UN isn't to the exclusion of, of other places that are, that are taking decisions that also impact people. And, you know, we've seen recently, for example, the the Financial Times um, picking up work that, that ICRIC had done to expose that the IMF was actually pushing Sri Lanka, um, the most heavily indebted um, uh, or debt uh, pressured country in the world, to sign up to the completely inappropriate, indeed revenue losing OECD proposals um, as part of the conditionality on their debt renegotiations. So we can't forget these other uh, institutions, um, as you say. But I want to think about the, the point you raised on the, the UN General Assembly and actually ask uh, Irene uh, a question on this. Um, you know, last year we had, you know, we had this breakthrough at the UN General Assembly where um, a resolution was passed by a unanimous consensus by the countries of the world agreeing to begin intergovernmental discussions uh, on a, an international tax cooperation framework under UN auspices for the first time, uh, and giving a mandate to the Secretary General to, uh, to write a report on the options. That report will be brought forward in September with uh, a new debate to follow at the General Assembly. And then the expectation is that a resolution will be brought forward that would begin formally the negotiations on a UN tax convention. And that's where, you know, the, the potential to really change the world is and, and to set in place at the UN uh, the rules and standards that could um, really bring an end to this type of cross-border tax abuse. But one thing that we hear, uh, you know, from journalists and in a sense uh, lobbyists on the other side um, uh, is, is this question. Um, and Irene, I think having worked in the UN system, you'll, you'll have heard this too. You know, some people just say it's foolish to expect a different outcome at the United Nations from anything that we could get at the OECD. And, you know, the OECD has, has really failed to make progress uh, over the last 10 years, despite having a very clear direction of travel. Um, so should we just accept that actually the lobbyists and the tax havens have too much power, whether that's at the OECD or at the UN? 
And so we shouldn't really expect any great difference if we if we do manage to get this process moving at the United Nations. What would what would your response be to that, Ivan Gray? I definitely support shifting the forum for negotiations to the UN. It would be a radical change for many reasons. Um, with the OECD, they the OECD is politically accountable to its members. And even within, even within its membership, the accountability is primary to the larger members of the OECD. Unlike that, with the UN, you have a secretariat that with all, the, with all the challenges that the UN may, ha may, may have, you know, it's, it's uh, an aggregation of, of uh, countries. And so a lot of the, the issues you see in the multilateral system are reflected there as well. But you still do have a system that is designed to report to all the members of the UN. And because these are almost all the countries of the world, you have political accountability to almost the whole world. That makes a huge, a huge difference. Um, the, the way the OECD process itself has, has, uh, has been managed really bears out that the UN would be a better forum. It would be a fairer, much more inclusive forum, a space in which the rules for negotiation are clearer, a space in which there is room for different regions to participate in defining the agenda and also in, in, um, having a voice and participating on an equal basis. This has not been the case with the OECD. Um, I've spoken to technical experts and political people you know, from countries that are participating within the OECD process, and they've talked about how the way in which that process was managed really fragmented the participation of countries that are not members, or I would even say core members of the OECD, the, the richer and more powerful members of the OECD. So you have um, technocrats um, from countries in the global south receiving uh, documents which are hundreds of pages, 24 hours or sometimes even less to a, a point where decision is required from them, uh, consultations by the secretariat with them without the participation of, of their of their political leadership from the finance ministries, the policy makers. And so all of this has been part of the way the OECD process has been has been mismanaged. Uh, in spite of it being called an inclusive process, it really has not been an inclusive process at all. Within the UN, you also have the groupings, you know, so the Africa group, for example, is one of them. But you have a more organized way of engaging of the, the region of, of all the regions, including the global south countries. You have uh, missions that are permanently located, you know, stationed at the UN, and which are able to follow these processes over time. One of the challenges that countries, um, low and middle income countries face with the OECD process has been the cost of engaging of, of flying teams to Paris, and so not being able to follow the, the, the process systematically. While for countries in Europe, it's a train ride away. It's much, it's much cheaper. Um, so definitely the UN would be a better space. Some people say the UN doesn't have the technical capacity. That is not the case. It has great convening power, which it has used and exercised quite judiciously in other similar processes, such as those relating to negotiations on the law of the sea many years ago, or more recently, the climate negotiation. And again, with the UN, you have a rule that allows participation and observer, observer participation of, of non-state actors. So civil society, the media, um, trade unions and so on are able to participate much more systematically within within the US UN process. There is significant pressure that countries are, are facing within the OECD process. And yes, that will also be brought to bear in the UN space. But because of uh, structural issues within the UN, there is much there's much more capacity to resist it and also to expose it. So I would really say that, that, that you, you know comparing the two is like night and day. Thanks, Irene. That's comprehensive and uh, very compelling. Um, so I want to go back to, to Owen um, you know, in relation to this. I guess the big, the big shift last year was that there was unanimous consensus, whereas historically, when 
the G77 group um, has has tended to bring this forward, the push for UN tax convention or a, or a global tax body at the UN. It's been blocked by the major OECD members. Um, and this time that didn't happen. As I say, it was it was unanimously supported this, this resolution. The US did put up an amendment that was kind of a, a wrecking amendment, but it didn't get much support. And then they and then they backed the, the main resolution. Now, what we've seen in the inputs to the Secretary General's report is the US and a number of other countries, Japan and South Korea, I think, and, and Liechtenstein, um, indicating that they're they're not supportive. Um, I guess you know you have members all around the world in, in the global south as well as the global north. But perhaps thinking particularly of your members in, in the global north, you know, maybe it's countries in, in Europe, perhaps where there's particularly a space. Do you see a, an option for them to become you know, more committed supporters of a UN process, given, given the, you know, the, the ongoing failure of, of the OECD process to deliver anything really against the, the scale of tax abuse? Well, I think First of all, it's probably worth reflecting on what, what what it was that led the UN to do that by consensus, which is, uh, I, I mean, obviously, it's, it's it, you know, you're all speculating, <laughs> we're all speculating, because it's not, uh, people don't have to give reasons. Um, the, uh, and actually, they very, they very often have to give fewer region, reasons when they do the right thing than they have to when they do the wrong thing, because they're not under as much, uh, as much pressure. But I think it's that pressure that actually, I, I you know, is the, is, is the reason why the, the UN UN took the step that it did last year, which is that increasingly, certainly in terms of verbal commitments and and statements, governments are, uh, I think, under uh, recognizing that they're under pressure from their peoples to uh, to redress the balance. And it and it is important to recognize that this is not particularly such a revolutionary shift in terms of, uh, of, of, of popular popular views, because actually in many cases, uh, we're, we're simply fighting to get back to the situation that we were in 30 or 40 years ago before uh, rampant tax abuse and, uh, and tax manipulation and the shifting of the, uh, of the tax um, uh, burden from, uh, from the rich to the poor took place. So we're only trying to claw back a, a, a situation that we've uh, we've we've been dragged into by the toxic uh, political effects of the concentration of of wealth. That uh, that tax abuse is just one of the more uh, egregious uh, examples of, and that then brings you on to to the, the actual question you ask. Apologies for the lengthy introduction, which, which is: Can we see the possibility of greater interest in these issues from? Uh, from uh, our people in uh, in richer countries um and uh, and i think the answer is yes that's precisely what led to the un vote in the first place uh, is the fact that there is a a growing shift where people are uh, are more and more aware of the way in which uh, tax abuse and and just the general tax rules as i say um are are not acting in the benefit of you know to the benefit of ordinary people uh, the rest as opposed to the rich uh, and so there is the prospect for, for for doing more in those areas but and this i think is the killer problem which is uh, which, which does apply to be honest as much to the un as it does to to any other body it's turning that better language into actual uh, practical uh, steps, concrete steps. And I know that that's one of the things that the TJN and ICRIC have done enormous amounts of, of work on, is how you actually translate those fine words into practical action that delivers more resources, uh, both to the, uh, to the state and to the, uh, to, to, to the rest of the population uh, from, from the rich. Um, and I think we still have have an enormous uh, task to perform in in that, uh, and and that 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 is what makes it really important that we mobilise as many resources as possible and as many organisations as possible. I, I don't think that when we uh, make the change that we need to make, it's not going to be on a 52-48 vote. 
right. So it's going to have to be uh, an overwhelming vote to overcome the uh, um, to overcome the power that is is represented by the tax abuse and the and the biased tax system that we have at the moment. Yeah, no, very much so. And, you know, what, one thing that we see, I think, that you know, the experience of the last, you know, two decades since since the Tax Justice Network was established is really that when processes are allowed to be kept as sort of technical, they end up being both relatively opaque and very heavily lobbied. Um, and the decisions consistently go in a certain direction. Just the fact of opening them up to a greater degree of transparency and accountability changes the kind of decisions that get made, changes the extent to which unseen lobbyists are able to exert particular power. And I think that's why we're seeing, you know, the kind of the, the Latin American and Caribbean summit that we're, we're going to join the opening session of um, after this, you know, following the, the work of the high level panel in Africa and the, the very impressive coordination among African policy institutions that's built political as well as technical bases for the decision making within those countries has really strengthened the degree of accountability um, and you know, the Latin American and Caribbean uh, process will we hope you know very much do that and you see it tying back to this question of how do you turn progress into uh, progress in terms of tackling tax abuse into positive benefits for broader society and one of the key elements there that a great many of the partners in the, the Cartagena summit um, are very engaged in, including the LADEP, the Justicia Fiscal, is around uh, wealth taxation, recognising that we need to go beyond just capturing a bit of this year's incomes, given how badly the current wealth distribution rests on the history of extractive processes and using some of that wealth in order to, to deliver better today for, for society. And that I'm where I, I need to go to Alison with a couple of questions on the methodology while we have um, Alison's expertise here. Um, so, Alison, there's a couple of questions that, that come in quite often from, from journalists who perhaps haven't been through all the, the detail of the methodology. Um, and I, I should put them to you so we have your, your answers kind of in, in the record here. But one of them is, you know, sometimes people think that we're assuming that all of the offshore uh, deposits in financial accounts are actually hidden, <clears throat> that they're not being declared to tax authorities in the home country. Now, th that's not the assumption that we make in, in the methodology, is it? Uh, thanks. No, it's not the assumption we're making. Actually, uh, we only look at the hidden profits, as I said before. Maybe sometimes we could make this a little clearer. So actually, the, the offshore wealth, the hidden offshore wealth, which we are looking at, is this part of wealth, which is actually undeclared. This is based on a like very well-published economic paper of Gabriel Sugman from 2013, and it's the so-called discrepancy method. So we actually only look at this part of the wealth, which is reported somewhere as a liability, but reported nowhere as an asset. So this is the part of wealth, which is actually, which doesn't really show properly. So where we have some discrepancy between what is supported in one country and the other country. So only for this part of the wealth, which is the 9.9 .9 trillion, which I report in my, in my presentation, we only try to give this wealth or to distribute this wealth to owners from different countries. This is what we do in our methodology, but this doesn't mean that all the offshore wealth is taken or is assumed to be hidden because there might be good reason that people can held their wealth in other countries. So we only look at the part of the wealth which is hidden in a sense that it's actually not matching the statistics of reported liabilities and reported assets. Yeah, um, thanks, Alison. But the other question, this is a silly one, I'm almost embarrassed to ask you. I don't think <laughs> we, we, we need your answer on the record. Um, some people have said that our numbers for the scale of corporate tax abuse um, are very stable over time. And that that's actually because we just don't want to acknowledge that the OECD has made some progress. Um, so what about that? Is, is that right? <laughs> uh, that's incorrect. But I think what is important maybe to highlight here again is that we are using OECD data to make these estimates. So in general, I think there, there are many types of criticism regarding our estimates, which are related to this data. And many of them I can actually understand well. But then I would even give responsibility back to the OECD to make sure this data gets better, that we get 
data on a better level, like on the company level. So we should have these public everybody country reports in order to improve our estimates. But actually, we are providing these reports based on what the OECD is publishing. We try even to correct for many mistakes with which the published data has. So if we wouldn't correct for these mistakes, I think our estimates would be way higher if we really try to try to just make a political statement here. So so no, we we bake the estimates based on OECD data. We do our best to correct the data, but we would really appreciate to have better data from the OECD, more data, more detailed data, and also more up-to-date data. Right. Um, thanks for, for, for that. I think that's really clear. Um, for, for people who are interested, actually, you know, last year we, we published a state of tax justice report for 2022 that had no new data because the OECD had missed even their own publishing um, schedule. And so the effect of that was, you know, we ended up writing to the G20 an open letter to say that the OECD has really dropped the ball on in their handling of what is quite an important global public good. Um, and so we've, you know, we've wanted to say that this, this data is too important to be, to be handled so badly. Back in 2020, the OECD began a consultation on, on their country by country reporting data. And they had an overwhelming response, not just from civil society, but from investors with trillions of dollars of assets under management, calling on them to require that the data be public so that we didn't have this five year lag, we had it from the companies within a year or so, and that the data that the OECD standard converged to what is a much more technically robust standard um, used by the global reporting initiative. Um, now, unfortunately, the OECD hasn't even responded to its own consultation, you know, and simply hasn't made any, any progress in this area. And this is another area where you know you could see a UN convention simply requiring that this data be made public. At the moment, though, we're in this position that, you know, where a country like Australia, for example, tries to require the data be, be made public, they find the OECD actually lobbying against them, lobbying in favour of opacity um, of this data. And that's, you know, because of the strength of the lobbying um, from multinationals, from the big four accounting firms, and also the OECD itself, it seems, sadly, um, being committed not to deliver on, on the transparency agenda. All of that leaves us using the best data that we can, which is better than it was before we began calling for, for country by country reporting, but still not nearly as good as it should be. And this report is inevitably doing the best we can with, with um, that data. But for that reason, you know, we're always engaged in the peer reviewed uh, literature, debating uh, and discussing how to improve things. And we're always interested to hear from uh, from people with with questions and comments uh, on on the methodology, so please do keep them coming in. For the moment, I'm going to stop here. We'll have a, a short break, um, just um, I think uh, a few minutes, as we hand over to the event, uh, the opening civil society event in the Cartagena uh, summit. We're going to hear welcome remarks from uh, Adrian Falco, who is the executive secretary of the Latin American and Caribbean Tax Justice Network. That's La Red de Justicia Fiscal de América Latina y el Caribe. And he's also the coordinator um, of an important um, civil society organization, Fundación CES. That will be followed by a hybrid uh, panel event, um, which again, you can follow here, um, which will be hosted by our colleague and um, the Tax Justice Network's international advocacy lead, um, Sergio Chaparro uh, Hernandez. For now, though, thanks very much for being with us for the launch of the State of Tax Justice um, 2023. A little break, but if you stay here, we'll have the, the session in Cartagena starting very shortly. Thank you to all of our uh, panelists, to Alison Schultz, to Irene Avonjovida, and to Owen Tudor. Um, it's been really great to have your input here, and we look forward to continuing to work with you on this agenda over the, over the coming uh, years. For now, though, um, uh, it's uh, goodbye from me, um, and we'll be joining colleagues in, in Cartagena shortly. So thanks very much. <laughs>